interest in it because of the fact that, for me, a rejection is really a killer thing. To offer somebody, like I offered Ken a chance to publish this book. He published this book some 25 years ago in a special edition of 100 copies of it. And uh, I signed quite a few of those copies, I recall. And uh, 100 of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but even asking Ken to publish these stories, I was very aware and sensitive to the fact that he just might not want to do it. And fortunately for me, he did, so we got the book published. And the copy you gave to this in Ohio State University. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Ohio State. Yeah, that's where I donated to, and it's there for the ages. There's a very strange story behind that, in that uh, it's just the way George wanted it. We printed it on one side of the paper, 224 pages. Most of them were with a clip. Fifteen of them were bound. We showed it at the Comic Con and we sold all 100 copies and never advertised the book. Everybody that saw the book there bought it. They were gone. One day. One day. Of course, George and I both gave a lot of them away. What the hell? We were, that's the way we both that, was, are. that was the whole point of publishing it, was to. Yeah, let it get it into the right collections. Let's get back to the point of you being a writer and being able to captivate people. You are you're a magician. You're you're a fascinating individual, and anyone that comes within striking range is automatically drawn like a magnet to George. George will never ever be alone in his life, or or he may be alone, but he will never be lonely. And now that you told me the thing about the orphanage, you filled your life with a myriad of people and experiences because your physical surroundings were oppressive. I was so you escaped your physical surroundings. And this is what you're all about. You help us escape our physical surroundings. If we listen to you, if we learn from you, if we become your, your audience, you help us to cope with the demons I've lived a rich life, Shel. I've lived a rich life. I've, my experiences are almost all hands-on. But what it did to me, and why you see me as different, is because I had to become a shaman type, which means that I had to become experiential. I had to learn everything my own way by tasting it or trying it. And I had to become exponent, I mean, uh, empirical in that if if this didn't kill me, and if this didn't kill me, and if this didn't kill me, then I, it's, it's safe. So I would learn all of my information about things this way, which is basically the shaman number. Instead of men fitting in and being a part of the community, he's willing to sort of be an outsider in the community and make his own way, and if necessary, sleep alone in the desert, and if necessary, eat the locusts, and therefore not be a burden upon the society. But he comes with a special wisdom because anything he knows, he really knows it. It's not theory. It's not something he read in a book. It's not something that should make sense. No, he knows that if you put this on that, it'll do this and it'll do that. And so my whole life has been basically a, an attempt to live what is classically known as the hero's journey. Oh, aren't you, weren't you a contemporary of Jack Kerouac? Yes. Were you about the yes. same age? Yes. Unfortunately, he died about 35. Yes. And uh, and you you beat the rap. I mean, you, you stayed the existentialist into what your 60s now. Yes, but I added to that uh, sort of a Zen thing, Zen Baptist. You know what the hell can you say about it? Out of Nazarene, because I'm a Christian to the core. I was raised by Christians. I know all about the Good Book. I know all the Jesus paraphernalia information, and I can talk for days with any Christian, and they will know that I know their lore, their doctrine, their their mythology. And for all given purposes, if any someone said, are you a Christian and do you believe in Christ? I would say yes. With the caveat in my mind, yes, I believe because my interpretation of Christ is going to be quite different from yours. Because I see Christ as the quintessential hippie. Mm -hmm. I see Christ coming across Galilee with a dozen guys walking with him, smelling to high heaven after a dozen days on that damn desert with hardly any water whatsoever. 
approaching some little farmstead or someplace where some guy and maybe a couple of people live with his wife and children, and they see these people coming, the first message is, all right, get the kids into the storm cellar, hide all of the liquor, make sure that the hiding places are secret, get the women out of sight, uh, we'll try and meet them before they get here so we can get an idea on their intentions. We don't want them getting all the way to the gate before we find out what we're up against because they look like brigands. They look like bad news. So this is, was my kind of, okay, Jesus then is a guy who is literally sit down outside the gate and send an emissary. Somebody come in and say, my master would love some water as if possible we could draw some from the well. Okay, well, yeah, it's polite enough. And then after a while, my master would like to meet with you and tell you, to give you his thanks in person. Is that all right? So that by the time that Jesus would get to the farmer, the farmer was pretty well convinced he was dealing with royalty of some kind, you know. So a prince from another land, if you will. That's why I always called myself a prince from another land, is because, no, n nearby I do not have a, a kingdom. But, well, yeah, my father is a king. Yeah, he, I, yeah, I know all that a prince needs to know because I was raised in a royal way. I know the game. That was, it's always been my attitude. And, uh, and when you were saying about my special attitude, one of the ideas I have about myself, it may be a fantasy, but my fantasy is that you could pick me up to, by magic right now and drop me on a street in Calcutta or Bombay or someplace where they don't even speak my language, and I will not suffer. I may have to sit down in a strange place for a while. Somebody will notice me. At some point, somebody will even bring me fucking food. I know it. Somebody will come up with a plate and say, we're having a picnic over here, and we saw you sitting over here. I tell you truly, I do, well, would never have to beg. I could always become interesting. Almost anything in my pockets can become trade goods. I can tell your fortune in an instant. I, I mean, that is to say, I, I know enough. See, I consider, the, I consider literature to be the science of human behavior. Let me ask you this question. If you had a really good childhood, like an Ozzy and Harriet family and everything, you think you would have become the person you are? No way in the world. No way in God's world. If I had not gone through well, everything... Well, said for a dysfunctional childhood. Everything I have gone through, the fact that I rose above it, that I was able to cope with it, that it did not bury me, I have every reason to be a delinquent, but I don't have a tattoo on me. I have never shot a needle into my damn body. I have no addictions. I am not addicted to anything. I am the world's best hippie. I have experimented, that's the word that Clinton uses, with all kinds of subjects, substances, as part of the shaman number. But I undertook everything I've ever done with the realization that I'm prepared to pay the price. You know, if I am searched by the law and found to have marijuana paraphernalia on me, I'm perfectly prepared to sign the thing or put out the hands or whatever is the rules around here. I'm a law-abiding citizen. I love the law. I, I believe in good cops. I hope the hell you've done a good job here. I, you know, I, why? Because I am innocent. I am innocent of anything anyone wants to lay upon me. No, sir, I live my life in a circumspect way. I no. am. You've done more than that. You've become a father. You've become a loving husband for 40 years. And a, you've become a father that produced two children. Both are very different from you. Extraordinary right? children. Okay. With Tell people. me about your children. They have consciences. You I have children with consciences. They, you could come and tell me that my son had committed a, a axe murder or, a, a, you know, some crime. You'd never convince me, not in a million years. I know that kid, he would not do that. There's no way you could force him to do that. You know, he, he, impossible for either of them to lie to me. I wouldn't tolerate it. I, I wouldn't punish them for telling me the truth, ever. I was always wanted to know the truth. I only punished my daughter once really seriously because she kept something from me. The fact that she'd started a fire in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have... I have got great great grand I mean I have grandchildren who are great. They are not great grandchildren, but I have grandchildren as well. No, I have I have everything that life asks for. My home is paid for. I've got I'm fixed as far as needing to kiss any kiss up to anybody uh -huh. for a job or for money or for work or for anything like that. And you never sold out. I have never ever sold out. Ever, ever. I've never done anything for expediency. Everything I've always done ever done I think is good. I'm prepared to show any piece of writing I've ever written, even a letter home, you know, as an example of me at my 
tourist. I mean, bass, whatever you want to call Can it. Can we talk about one property that you wrote for Twilight Zone, and that is Kick the Can. Could you describe the history of that, what, what prompted you to write it, and what it's about? Yes, I will. I belong to a little writer's